about what game can do. My name is Olaf S. Kylander and I'm the author of the Game Users Manual and I will try to um, show you what you can do with GIMP, some small things. And what I will show you today is some uh, things that you can't do in any other image manipulation program that is, is affordable for humans or um, that are very sp and are that functions that are very special for GIMP. I will also show you some ordinary image manipulation pro um, tricks to make selections and uh, image comp composition and so on. So I hope you will uh, enjoy the show and uh, have something with you back from this uh, tutorial or workshop. And all of you, I want you, all of you to be GIMP addict <laughs> addictives. So uh, GIMP is the program to use if you're gonna go web graphics or if you're gonna go home and Soho office uh, image manipulation pro uh, and it's not used for pre-press. That's a main minus point for GIMP and whereas Photoshop is much better. But hopefully it will be better in forthcoming versions of GIMP and I will try to uh, explain all the pros of GIMP as long as we uh, as we go along this little workshop. I'm uh, terribly sorry, but uh, the picture here is very bad. It's due to um, the beamer, and uh, I can quite nicely see my picture here on the screen. But uh, unfortunately, it's sunny today, or light. It's light in here, and we don't see the screen uh, the picture as well. And uh, I hope you can manage to see anyway. The first thing I will talk about is <coughs> revision control. How many times do you think an uh, artist sits and saves and she saves his wo she, her work once and once and once and once, okay? And then when she is in the middle of the work, oh Jesus, this is not good. I want to go back five or 10 or 15 steps to someone save a long way back and do it again. It's, po it's possible, again, it's quite easy you are all dependent on a plugin that is called XD in GIMP. That is a revision control plugin for the X delta function. And what you get is when you save and save your image, uh, the difference between each sa save is saved in a buffer or something like that in the, in the file. And when you open the image or reload it from disk, you can see here that uh, you get a list of different versions here. And I have selected the second version and pressed select. And up comes my second save of the file. And you can have 100 saves or 1,000 or whatever you want. But it's a very nice feature if you work with graphics and want to have the availability to go back and take a work since it's gone bad. Or you, you must want to have it as a, a base for another graphics that you will make. And this is revision control and it's revision control made positive. It's not something that is hard to use like maybe you have heard of CVS and free software development and all that kind of stuff and it's command line, command line, command line. This is a nice graphic interface and you get revision control by, by the second. And this is a feature that GIMP is more or less alone about. I don't know any graphics manipulation program that has it affordable for humans. <laughs> okay, we, we are here to talk about image and image manipulation and graphics production and one of the keystones in image production or graphics production is image composition. And you often want to blend two images into each other in a nice way. And um, you can sit there and select and uh, do all kind of stuff to make them float into each other. But the way to use it is to use layers. I hope everybody here knows what a layer is in an image. A layer is more like um, a, a transport sheet that you have um, when you, uh, you had done overhead projects and you have transport sheets and you can place the transport sheets over each other and you can combine the layers in all different kinds of ways. And the way is to have one of the images in one layer and the other image in another layer and try to combine them in different ways. 
and you combine them by using layer masks. And layer mask is a little um, uh, is a is a selection tool. You can say it makes. Um, here you can see we have the boy in the upper layer, and we have the horses in the down uh, lower layer. And as you can see, there are some dark spots here, and the dark spots make the lower layer come up and be visible. So here we have a cubic um, view of the horses in the water and the boy is coming is um, visible also. And here is a, just another little um, uh, way to do it. It's done with a, the original image is taken as a, a mask and we have distorted it a little bit and make it noisy and painted it in, in it little. And you see it smoothly goes it, the boy, head of the boy is growing up of, out of the water and it's a bit grainy and I think it's quite a lovely image but when you want to blend image do it with masks it's the tool to use and it's lovely to use okay one of the cornerstones in image manipulation is to select and all of you have probably sitting in some uh, been working in some kind of image manipulation program and being sitting there with a fuzzy selector or selecting pixel by pixel or something like that. It takes a lot of time. And the key is to have master selections. If you master selections and know how to do your selections, you will master image manipulation. And here we want to create a little nice image. And we begin by using select by color, but not just selecting by color, we have taken a very large fussiness here in this selection and fussiness makes a selection smoothly tune out. It starts where the selection is and it smoothly t tunes out. So it's the, if you fill the selection with something, the, f uh, the, fill, uh, the color that you fill with will smoothly trans uh, transform, uh, disappear on, on the edges of the selections. And we didn't do that here. We used a little effect is called bump mapping. And bump mapping is, mm, is more or less making it a bit 3D styled. And the boy, we have bump mapped the boy. And as you see, pro hopefully see, <laughs> the upper one is the selection. And the, the, here you see the, the image that we get when we do the selection by color. And it's quite fuzzy. And here we have applied the bump map, and the boy's face has uh, turned a little bit uh, porcelain or something like that. It's, um, uh, it has been changed in a way, and uh, de there is some depth in the eyes and uh, depth in the lips of the boy. Now, OK, we wanted to do something with the background, so we did it in the reverse, more or less. So, and we added a bit of bump mapping and texture to the ba background. So now the boy is a bit different than the, from the beginning. And we wanted to have some glory around the boy. So we did a color selection of the hat. And in the selected area, we're on uh, edge detect. And the edge detect will highlight the edges. So the edges here are Gl uh, are glowing a little bit like a Gloria. And what we will now do is to turn this into a duotone. And a duotone is an image that is composed of two colors, and it can be gray or yellow or yellow or red or whatever you want. And best of all, you can print it. It's quite easy, and GIMP supports this very well. So you can go to your print shop and print your duotune du because you just makes uh, make great plates. You will see it in a minute. Here is the duotune, and it's a duotune in yellow and black. And we have filled it. And as you see here, here is the two channels. There is the yellow channel up there, and there is the black channel down there, and they are grayscale images. So all you do is you take those channel images to your print shop and say, I want to have this image as the yellow, and this image should be the black, and they print it. What, uh, I've been maybe a little bit fussy about the explanation. 
you say to him, I want that image to be the black plate and the upper image I want to have to the yellow plate and you choose the color of a, from a Pantone map or something like that and you print it and it will come out like that up there. This is, the upper image is just for, so you can have an idea of, of, of the outcome. It's not the exact print, but it's an idea, and you have the map with the Pantone colors. Pantone colors are a widely known uh, ink factory that makes inks. You have probably heard of them. So to say that it's a lot of license and such stuff, and game probably can't support it without a bit fussy. And we have used the Duotune in a little creation of a booklet here. I hope there isn't anybody who's speaking Chinese or some Eastern Asian language because I don't know where what the science means. That was taken from the X font server. I think it's quite lovely output. And I must say, it's not me that have done these images. It's my wife, who is the co-author of the manual. And she couldn't be here today. It was meant to be, but we have a little daughter who is six months old, and uh, we couldn't arrange with babysitting, so I had to go myself. And she had probably been describing this a bit better than me, because I'm a technician and not a graphic artist. Anyway, I will go on and talk about graphics anyway, in the best way I can. And here I will talk about another creation and that's highlight and shadows and bending bending things along a curve or here we have bent a uh, text along a curve and we have highlighted it and we have made it 3D and a little bit like that. We will see how we have done this. It's not as hard as you can think. First of all we have used the Gdyne text plugin to GIMP. It makes, if somebody has used GIMP's ordinary text tool, you have find it a bit limited because you can only add one line text and you can't edit the text after you have rendered it into the image because the tool doesn't remember what you typed. But in um, dynamic text that, and, uh, that this plugin is called, in a more human word, <laughs> Uh, you can type in the text and the text will be rendered into GIMP and if you say, oh shit, I was a um, spell error here, I can go back into the layer and invoke the filter again and whoops, up it comes and you can change the text and you can reapply it and the text will be corrected. And you can have multi-line text also, it's just press enter and you will get a new line. And you can control rotation here, you can control color and all sorts of things. It's quite nice tool to have. The basic text tool in GIMPs is pretty useless when you have get used to this one. Okay, we have now written the woodland text and we want to bend it. And bend it we done do in a plugin that is called Curve Bend and it's a nice little plugin that let you manipulate uh, anything from <laughs> selections to layers to whole images or whatever you want in GIMP and bend it along a curve. As you can see, the upper curve and the lower curves controls how the bending is done. And is, if you see here, you can see that they have stretched away, stretches, stretch apart the, the curves in the, in the left hand here. And there are coming together in the right end, and this makes the image uh, or the, um, the text looks like it's coming waving here, and it's going away from you in the right end. It's quite easy to use this, and you can, be the best of all, you can save your curves and reapply them to another part of your image or other text. If you want have several text lines and you want to reapply them and have the same bending, you can do it easily because you can save the curve. And in, or naturally, as in every game plugin that I have come across, it's the big difference between Photoshop and game plugins is when you open a Photoshop plugin, you have quite limited uh, way to do things there. I'm not saying that the Photoshop plugin does the job bad, because it does 
the job very, very good all the time. It does what you want and it does it quick and you don't have to think that much. But when you use a GIMP plugin, most of the time you have to think a lot and know what you want to do because it's so much more parameters most of the time that you can use. And here is a, well, not maybe the best parameter plugin, but there are several that are so filled with parameters and function that you can adjust, that you can explore the plugin in maybe a day or two or three, and you have still not explored every possibility in the plugin. A plugin is, can be a filter and a plugin can be a thing that can save things in GIMP, but. So the key is to use GIMP plugins. They are free, they are downloadable for free and not as pricey as <laughs> Photoshop equivalent and naturally GIMP is also free. It's a new program, but GIMP plugins are really great most of the time. Anyway, we have now bended the codes and out comes the bended text of the woodlands. Now we want to make this text a little bit 3D, so we want to bump map it. But if we bump map the upper text that is sharp, the bump map will not look good it will be unrealistic. So we have to add a little bit of fussiness to it and then bump map it and it will be much better as you can see in the next image here. The woodlands are now quite 3D but uh, there is no tree, uh, wood structure and there is um, a lot of else things to do here. So we want to highlight first um, and uh, we want to highlight uh, highlights and we want to make sh uh, the shadows a bit more visible. And we do that by making a dark image will uh, make the highlights glow. And as you see in the dark image here, there are small, small parts where, which are white and that will be the highlights and the, the rest, the black will not be visible. It will not affect the image that we're gonna highlight. And in the lower image, you see there are some black parts and that will, so to say, so to say make the shadows more visible. And what you, you work with here is that you have one layer, you have three layers here. You have the bump map layer and you have the highlight layer and you have the shadow layer and the shadow layer, uh, the bump map layer is in the bottom and uh, the two other layers are on top. And you put the layers in different modes and you put, to make the highlights, you put it in screen mode and to make the shadows, you put it in multiply mode, which is burn, which makes things dark and screen makes things light. And what, 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 what is that we want to make light? It's the light parts in the dark image and it's what want to do what do, do we want to make dark and it's the dark image in the light image so you will see it in the next and you will probably understand it as you can see here in the woodlands the upper part where the white was is highlighted and there is a bit more shadow in uh, where the dark part <coughs> was in the light <laughs> image and now we want to cut, uh, we have applied a pattern here over it. It's quite easy, but we want to cut it out. So we have, want to have a uh, mask that cuts the sh uh, cut away the, the wood structure. And we, we have saved <coughs> the, the thing that was the output of, um, output of the curb band and we have inverted it and the white will make, will not affect the image, but the black will. It will erase what's around. And we want to erase the wood structure that is surrounding the, the characters. So it will cut out the wood for us. And what you see in the bottom is also layer. This layer will make the left part of the woodlands a bit dark and uh, the right parts of the woodlands uh, will be lighter, lightened. So the text will go from dark to lighter. 
and you will see it here in the next image, the outcome of it. As you see here, the text is a bit darker here, and it's a bit lighter in the, in the end. And what you see behind the woodlands is a forest, isn't it? And that forest is made in GIMP, solely in GIMP. There is no 3D, and there is no scanning, and there is no nothing. It's just GIMP, and it's a plugin called EFS Compose. And this plugin is more or less the most amazing thing I have ever come across. It, you can make every organic shape in this plugin, from watercolor to trees, or from Jurassic animals to, to worms, or whatever you want. <laughs> That's the base because it's everyf everything in this uh, is based on fractals, and uh, you can tune the fractals to make patterns, uh, make structures for you. And you can, the fractals you can, you can apply color to the fractals. So how do we do the tree, the trees in the forest behind the, the text? I will try to show you that. I'm not the master of this tool. My, my wife is; she's really marvelous when she works with it. When you bring up the EFS Compose for the first time, you will just have a triangle. Here is a preview of the outcome on the right, and the, on the left is the working area. And the triangles is the thing that you will bend around and adjust and add more triangles and so on, and you will get a shape. And she have turned them this is my wife's work, so she have turned them around a little bit, and it starts to look different. And uh, now she had added uh, another triangle, which makes it appear, uh, it m will make more uh, fractals in the middle. And now she turns it around, and it looks like nothing. But when she do the next move, it will start to look some something. She stretches the middle triangle to make the trunk of the tree. <coughs> and it looks not, uh, not so good at this stage of the work, but we will proceed anyway. And now she have put it back together and uh, also scaled the other parts. And now it looks like some kind of salad that I don't eat. But uh, it looks like broccoli, doesn't it? And um, broccoli is a bit like trees. So if we are a bit more work, we maybe we're going to get a tree. And now she adds yet another triangle that is uh, forming the part where the trunk goes up and uh, creates the leaves, leave, leaves in the tree. The the bounding of the tree, I don't know the English word for it. And now she has stretched out it, and the, this looks like a tree, doesn't it? But it's black at the moment. But the thing with this plugin is that you can apply colors to each of those triangles. And the color will affect the other triangle. So whatever you do in this plugin will affect another triangle, and it will um, so say, work in the whole image. So she, here we have applied a little bit of green in the, in the highlighted triangle that is a bit more black. And as you see, the whole left part of the, the tree is now greener. And if you start to add a little different types of green into the leaves of the three, you will get quite nice green look of the leaves. And naturally the trunk will get brown. And here is the final outcome. Here. It looked like a tree. Okay, this was a bit of manipulation, but uh, it's quite nicely described in the GIMP user manual that are downloadable for free, and you can buy it in German also. It's on manual.gimp.org, and there is a wonderful description how to do it, and you can try it out. So we just did a lot of trees <laughs> here to create this forest. And if you want to do something nice here, you, you can add a little 
in this this is the bottom layer and we can have a layer on top and that layer on top is a gray gradient that goes from gray in the bottom to white in the top and here's looks like a bit of sunny morning or it's just morning and it's a bit um, moister in the air and the sun comes in but if you change the we change the layer mode. Mode affects how the layer works when they're bound together, when they are viewed together. If we change the layer mode of the upper layer, that was the gradient, we hereby create a sunshiny morning. It's, just, it's the same gradient, but it's a different mode. And this is a light and only layer that we have put in the upper gradient in. And if we want to go further, we want, uh, it's not nice with sun, it's too hot. We want it to be a bit more rainy or it just had been raining or something like that. It's not looking that, it's, uh, it's a bit light here, but uh, you'll see that it's a bit more foggy. And that's what we have done in a multiply mode that burns. It burns, it makes things darker and here's the begin darker in the bottom and less darker in the top and you see it's more moisture in the air and we have added yet further another layer that it's just a rain pattern from GIMP but it's clearly raining here so uh, just adding a layer and put it in the right mode and you will get quite astonishing effects The new GIMP is support X input, and X input is what can make it able for you to draw on a tablet. And I hope you all know what a tablet is. A tablet is a thing you can draw with pressure sensitive pens and such things. I have a tablet up here, you can look at it. And instead of drawing with a mouse, which this feels like drawing with a baseball glove and a both hands behind your back and put it, uh, put a baseball glove in your mouth and try to paint around with it anyway. It's not working to paint with a mouse. <laughs> you can paint with a pen and a pen is what you normally paint with if you have painted before. <laughs> and we will try to sketch out this image from, we have taken this as a as a ground to sketch along and we will sketch this image and put the lady which is, happens to be my wife's mother in a retro style 60, 60 ad taken in New York but the picture is from London so we'll start with a sketch and we use a special tool from the new GIMP and GIMP, this is feature that is only available in the developer version of GIMP and that's the ink tool and the ink tool is really nice to work it. It feels like drawing with a $700 ink pen and it's so smooth and it's uh, sensitive to speed. When you speed up the line will get thinner and when you speed down the line the line will get bigger and when you tilt the pen the line will get different so it's just like drawing with a natural ink pen it's lovely even I am not an artist thinks it's really nice to work with and here she has sketched the uh, outline of her mother with the ink pen it's just easy you put the image uh, under on the tablet and sketch along just under a plastic or on the table and you sketch here and you can um, and get this or you can have it on the screen and sketch along the screen uh, follow the screen uh, with your pen but it's very easy to just put a, a picture on your tablet and trace it along and you will look like a real nice artist <laughs> even if you can't now we have to fill this lady with some skin tones and we are just filled it with a Fill tool. Uh, we are painted with behind mode, and we, with behind mode is a is a quite nice uh, feature in GIMP that you you, you paint behind the black outer structure, 
even if you paint over it, so, so to say, but all the color ends up behind. And we have painted with a, with a natural skin tone here behind the black lines. So you only see, you can see here, the, you can see down here that uh, it goes, when you paint it goes up here and the color is not visible behind the black line. And as I said, we, you, when you use the ink pen, the lines will be quite hard. But now we want to have something that is smooth. We want to have smooth shadows and smooth color transition in the face of her mother. And uh, as you can see, you can take a fussy pen and uh, when, you, uh, when you draw with a pressure sensitive pen, the, uh, the opacity will change. And uh, in the left here, we have a little harder pen, and we have a more sketchy like uh, drawing of the arm than of the face. The GIMP is naturally always developed. The development version is under development, and so to say, there are new features added all the time. And my friend Sven has just added a feature for brush scaling and and. Um, gradient uh, painting uh, if you paint press right re, the paint the color is taken from a gradient and the gradient uh, has some uh, length and ha the harder you press um, the mm, let's put this right if you have a gradient and the gradient goes from say blue to red red in one end and 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 blue in one end if you press hard you will get red and if you press light you get blue so you can change the color as you press the pen for example it's a quite cool feature but uh, i don't know the use of it but it's nice to know that there are a lot of upcoming uh, uh, presses and x input support in the new upcoming gimp so uh, everyone with the tablet is lucky when they get hold on a new version when it's stable anyway we want to proceed here and this is a bit earlier we have filled the uh, uh, the, the the dress of her mother with a pattern, and we have painted a little uh, handbag with a brown color with a pressure sensor. Uh, no, it's a pattern also, so pattern is quite useful. And what we will do here is to have uh, the background, and the background is first of all an ordinary picture, and then we sketch quite fast along this image is the original and then we sketch something that is more or less looking like it okay and then we have the original image behind and we put it into screen mode i think it is and the white parts in the image behind will light up in the upper layer so you see the the note up uh, uh, in the window of the van is not visible in the first sketch, but in the last one it is. And that's no work to do that, it's just putting the layer into another mode. And the note will be visible. And this makes a rough sketch look really good. And it's fast. You don't have to work that much, but you will get a nice sketch anyway. This is easy to do with also with the mouse, just sketch along and you can sketch quite quick and then uh, put uh, the layer into screen mode, I think it is. It's described also in the GIMP user manual in the first GIMP round chapter, how to do this. And here's the final outcome of the image. It looks quite nice, I think. Okay, I'm a technician, so I must talk about technical stuff. And GIMP is <laughs> made by a lot of technicians, so naturally there are added a lot of tech stuff into GIMP, but most of it are quite useful. And a feature that is called Horospec X, I call it in Sweden anyway. <laughs> I don't know the English pronunciation, and the guy is Italian, so I don't know if there is a proper pronunciation of this word. It's a 
it's the GIMP database. You integrate GIMP with a database. And imagine you can sit and fetch images directly from a database into GIMP, and you can save images from GIMP into database, OK? What use do I have uh, for this as an artist? You have one big use of this. How many times have you been looking around for an image that you made four or five months ago? And you look around quite a long, long time before you find it. And you end up saying, oh, I didn't find it. And I have to go to a special program that is loading a lot of thumbnail images. And you have to sit there and look for it. And it takes a lot of time. Instead, you have typed in some keywords, or you can search for it by color or whatever. I will show you here. First of all, when you bring up horror specs for the first time, you have to create a database. And this is the create database window. And it's quite easy to manage. It's nothing hard, even. Everyone can do it. You just enter the database name and uh, what table to use and the username of you. In this case, it's Olaf or I'm Olaf. And we have called the database horror specs. And uh, the table name is uh, CCC for Chaos, Chaos Computer Camp. And the list is number one. It's just names that have chosen the first and the second. And it's done with when you initialize the database for the first time. That is done in a console mode. Sorry to say there is no, there is no, um, there is no uh, GUI to make the first initialization of the get database. But it's just one command. Anyway, then you have a lot of parameters that you can use in your database. And depending on your needs, you, don't, you want to be able to query for different things. And here's a big list that you can query for. You can build a database that can be searchable uh, by a number of parameters. And what you do is that you have parameters here, and you drag them to the flow, it's called. And the flow is where which parameters that will be available for searching in your new database that you create. And I have drawn some features that is, uh, can query the database for all kind of color values and color variations in the image. And what can be good for that? Because if you have an image that um, is similar to one, the one you search, you have an image of a... Um, for say a red car with a standing in front of some trees, and then you can, then you want to see if you have similar structure of Im image that has images in your database that has similar structure than the, that the image that you have loaded, and you can then query the database for images that are kind of the like the same type that the image you have. And naturally, you can uh, con uh, construct databases that can quiver your, your image for with the height, revision number, keywords, uh, file name, um, the comments, uh, or last save, or uh, some text, or if it has layers, or color type, or whatever, histogram. And uh, there is a lot of, to choose from. And uh, this is a little bit of trying and uh, see what's good for you in the beginning, and uh, build up a database of maybe 20 or 30 pair images and see what's, uh, what's your query with, uh, would be nice to have, what you want to have to query with. And then you just drag the right, value, uh, the right types over to the flow and press create and the database is created. And now you can start to use it. And it's very easy. You opened one or several image is in GIMP, and then you open Horospex X, which is accessible from one of the GIMP menus, the extension menu. And then you press Insert, and all the open images that you have opened in GIMP will pop up here. And you just have to select one by pressing on it and say Insert, or you can press several. And up will come, I have created here a, a database that uh, you can search for subject and keywords. And the subject here is food. And, and no, the database I have created here is a, 
is the database uh, where you can put in subject and keywords and also with height and uh, some other things. But anyway, you type in fold here and keywords, so it's a lobster. So then you can, next time you search your database, you can search for fold and will you get up all your fold? Or you can search for just lobster and you will get lobster or you can search for both and you can search if this lobster images has layer and so on. It's quite easy. Just imagine the possibilities. And here is uh, where I uh, build up what I will query for. And Horospex X feels what the database can search for or what can be searched for in the database and that you will end up to have in the middle and you drag what you will search for into the flow and you can set the subject here I've set subject to book and the keyboard here keyword will be boy in this case and I will run a query for uh, this to select all images that uh, have a subject of book and a keyword of boy and up that will pop. And when they have popped up, you can load them directly into GIMP and start edit. And that's the really nice thing because imagine that you're working on an advertisement firm or a, a web firm or web bureau or what it's called. And you're sitting and do web graphics and a whole bunch of people. And you have bought a big, nice image, uh, Sto uh, photo stock images on CD-ROM and you download, first of all you download it with um, some script because you have probably some technician that can make a script download it into the database and sort it by keywords and color and all that kind of stuff and when you sit then and do your web graphics within GIMP because GIMP is the natural tool to do web graphics in and you can then just quiver a database for uh, some word and up uh, the right image comes and you open it in GIMP and start your work. You don't have to go to external program and search the database. The database search is searched from within GIMP and you do the editing of the image directly. This is quite nice. And you don't have to be on the same machine because this is naturally uh, can go over network or it, <laughs> the image database can be on one side of the earth and you can be on the other and you can still fetch the image and edit it. <laughs> and when you have edited the image, you can have nat naturally load it back to the database with some keyword that you have edited it and uh, home uh, and a new name of the image and whatever you want to do. And that's a good thing. Just imagine if you can connect this together with newspaper or the manufacturing in that you where you, the people that do the imaging is working first, edit, uh, fetch the image from the image database and then bring it up, edit it, and set some special keywords for where in the paper it should be, and uh, then the paper layout program automatically fetch the image and places in the right place and you just have put a low resolution in the real image, in the real paper, so it's quite nice to have this feature. Oops, I took two here. I wanted to show you how it looks when you search for um, an image that has the same ASVU saturation value. That, um, you search for image by US, uh, use saturation and value and then you load an image that you have opened in GIMP this is the image you will have want to search for image that is similar structured in color in the ASV color space as this lobster image and up all that images will come and it's quite nice that you have the uh, PixMap here so you know what images you have uh, will quiver the database with And when you get a result, it looks like this. Here is a result when I search for book and boy, and up came two images in this case. And I can choose the XF file, which is a native GIMP uh, file format, or I can choose the more the TIFF format, which, uh, which is uh, more generic. And I just 
select the image and press load and up it will pop in GIMP and you can start edit or whatever you want. It's very nice. That was what I had to present today, but uh, naturally we are here for free for questions and you are, can uh, ask questions in both English and uh, German. And we will, tra if you ask it in uh, German, we will translate it into English so the English people can understand and um, we'll try to answer it as best as we can. And as you maybe know, there is a GIMP hacking tent in the Art and Beauty tent. GIMP section actually in the GIMP, uh, the Art and Beauty tent, and we are four guys here. It's me and it's uh, Michael or Mitch and Sven and Simon, which are developer here of GIMP, and we are ready to answer questions about GIMP uses and GIMP future and whatever you want. So you can start asking now. Thanks for your time. At the meantime. to ask questions about whatever you like, about the GIMP development, about features you saw. Don't be shy. Uh, Sorry, I, I didn't get you. You have to speak up. Yeah, okay, I can answer the question. I'm not quite sure about how this is, uh, will be supported in plugins because I'm, I'm mainly programming the GIMP core. Maybe we could first uh, first uh, answer the que uh, answer the question what he was asking about. It's uh, it's so that the first version of GIMP that is now the stable version that you all have in your Linux distributions and so on. It's not multitasking and uh, it can't thread. And what threading is about is that it divides uh, execution of the program into several threads so it can go quicker if you have several processors or you have a fast processor with several pipelines in. And the new game supports threading and multiprocessors and he just asked questions how to configure that and how to use it in plugins. Because he wanted to write some plugins, I suppose. You also wanted to know which part of GIMP already uses multi-threading? It's basically the final uh, layer composition system where you and, and the iteration over areas of pixels which can be uh, multi threaded and, and which are currently multi threaded. I yeah. So think, um, plugins are developed by uh, one author and you also can't can decide to do multi threading like everybody wants to do it. Like you can do any multi threading you want in a plugin. We, we could provide a possibility to get the information out of the preferences dialog to the plugins so you can know how many processors there are. But as far as I know, there's, there are no plans to add further multi processing to the core. The image compass c compositing uh, layer of GIMP. Uh, it's one, it's one of the parts which uses most of the CPU time because if you have 100 layers or something and all are more or less transparent or have some layer modes set, it takes some time to combine them to the final projection of the image and this part of... Yes, there are. it's called uh, image, map. image map, and uh, you just load, you first you make your um, clickable the image that is supposed to be clickable. You make it in GIMP, 
then you load it into your image map plugin and uh, create uh, areas that you want to have be clickable and uh, fill in some dialogues that where what should happen when when they click on that area and so on and then you press generate or something like that it's described in the new second edition of the manual that is soon to be do downloadable or you can buy and the thing is that you then cut in the text in your HTML page and it's ready to go so it's quite easy it's well described in the manual also and um, you can just go to reg register.gimp.org to fetch the newest version Of what? Yeah, that, that's very well uh, supported. I think it is. <laughs> Type out of, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe 50 formats or something. 50 formats supported? You can even load the MPEG file into GIMP and start edit it and uh, save it again. A what? Movie file. A yeah, movie file. MPEG movie file and uh, edit it and uh, uh, then save it again. Maybe you want to remove every second layer or every second uh, frame or whatever you want or you want to convert the MPEG to a GIF animation or you can do pretty much whatever you want or um, a rough uh, animation studio in GIMP that you can do very very advanced animations in. The thing is that the uh, user interface is not the world's friendliest. But uh, I suppose someone will work on that. But it's very, very powerful the uh, image manipulation functions for animations in GIMP. Will you add, um, will you add some more vector based features to GIMP? So, so there's not, not everything with, with BitLab. It's easier for some things that you can do with better vector brackets. I think basically the GIMP is, of course, um, uh, bitmap manipulation program and I'm not sure about how much um, you should uh, insert from a huge program like Corridor. Personally I think um, it would be better to have separate tools for those different types of graphics but there are some elements for vector graphics in the developer version there is a management for paths and um, you can store the paths and stroke them or convert them to selections or fill them and well yeah and there are also uh, well to know is oh, that gfig i forgot gfig <laughs> gfig is a plugin that makes vector drawings possible in gimp but it's quite limited for more advanced vector drawing but uh, anything that you want to draw circles and uh, spirals or whatever it is you can do it in gfig and um the type of uh, vector graphics that you use on a website, for example, is, uh, is well, uh, you can do that in the GFIG, it's no problem. But there are also development of uh, three or four vector drawing programs, and uh, I know that uh, at least two of them, uh, the GIVE and the Sketch vector drawing program that is under development, will have uh, various paths to GIMP that is, which makes it possible to import export uh, vector um, vector graphics into GIMP and uh, do me a bitmap manipulation with the vector graphics and load it back to the, uh, the next the program again. Um, is there any feature to do a CYK uh, separation? Not at the moment. It's a very big project. First of all, you have not just SMIK support because when you do it, you can also add hexachrome or octachrome or whatever how many channels you want in the game. It's idiot idiotic to just add one more channel, as you can uh, add more. And then uh, you have the problem with uh, if you want to go into prepress, which I suppose you want to do if you want uh, SMIK support. Then you have problem with color correction, and that's a uh, very large project to tackle and there are also patents and licenses and all that kind of stuff so it's kind of hard I don't know if any of uh, Sven or me, Michael or um, Simon have been looking into it uh, but I have, I have a little and it's very hard to do I can tell you it's actually not, I yeah I don't know if somebody is really working on it because it's uh, 
all internal data structures in GIMP are RGB, are RGB which um, 8-bit RGB, which means you have one byte for each color channel and one byte for the alpha channel. And many parts of the GIMP code make um, implicit assumptions about that. So there's no uh, more or less generic uh, uh, tag uh, buffer has to indicate what kind of data is in it. So the whole GIMP realized that it's all RGB, so you have to change almost every function which um, modifies the image to achieve proper RGB support and uh, to achieve proper support for other color spaces. And if we do this, we would probably like to add support for higher image resolutions too, color resolutions. There is a project. There is a project doing this, and they have a better buffer and image uh, handling system, which could be extended to uh, do other color systems too. But the, with the current state, without this um, deep image GIMP version merged, it might be a bit hard. It will be a later question. It's not will not be in this stable uh, in no. the next uh, version. Definitely that it will not. be stable, and it will be in GIMP 2.0 or something like that. <laughs> it's a big and project and anyway. And that's zero. And the plus one. Can you tell when the next stable version will come out? No, naturally not. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we can say that there are currently uh, discussions about the feature freeze in some days. Well, we hope we can uh, bring in our latest changes we did here at the camp and um, hopefully, but uh, don't count, count on this, hopefully the next stable version 1.2 will appear at the end of the year or so. But there's nothing that's promised, don't tell this to other people. <laughs> <laughs> a good guess is that it will be delayed a little bit, I suppose. You can have a chat about it, those projects. Yeah. Yeah? Uh, is it possible to use uh, Beam or some features of Beam from the command line to generate graphics uh, from the script? Yeah. There is uh, first the, um, the first scripting extensions to GIMP, GIMP was ScriptFoo. Yeah. And um, I personally like it, but it's quite limited. And um, Mark Lehmann did a huge job to um, create a Perl interface. Um, which I, I don't like Perl, so I didn't try it yet. <laughs> and uh, you, but can there are, you can use uh, other languages too. There are Python, Python interfaces and um, what else? There are C, D, C directly. Uh, TCL interface. TCL. There are some cool features in the Perl uh, Perl uh, version that you can uh, do it over a network or. You can have one game running and uh, process an uh, image and fetch, fetch it again and all sorts of things. But the Perl interface does some real cool abstractions, so yeah. if you have a um, more generic uh, access to the GIMP data structures from Perl than from Seam or C maybe, does some internal um, recalculations and automatic stuff you would have to do by hand otherwise. Yeah. There is no game without X, this is a problem. <laughs> there's, there's no GTK without X, and we need GTK for the internal object system too. Yeah, you but can, you, you can, can have, you can have the, there are systems, you can run an X, B, and C server on yours, yeah. and then you don't need X, that, it will not eat that much power. You, you can run a virtual X. Yeah. X virtual frame buffer device. Uh, virtual frame buffer. A virtual device. frame buffer device X that you can start on any machine. It doesn't even need to have a graphics card. <laughs> but uh, I think um, you should uh, not rely on GIMP for that kind of job. GIMP is an uh, interactive tool. It's my personal thing. I don't think GIMP is fit for batch processing 10,000 images. <laughs> It should be, yeah. <laughs> First of all, there are patent uh, patent that you have to work around. <laughs> That's the first thing. Well, 
Um, the the second no thing is that it's not that easy that it may seem to be. It's <laughs> not easy at all. It has to do with the, uh, the color range that you have and uh, how you compress and decompress uh, color ranges. And uh, there is no uh, nice way to do that in the current system of ICC, which is the which is today uh, the today common way to do color calibration. So you have to do that by your own to expand and. Uh, uh, to compress uh, the color gamut area, and that's not easy. It's very hard to do that fast, first of all. Yeah, we can show you, actually. Yeah, the, the thing was that the screen was so screen. bad to view, so I kind of was hard to present for you, but I will naturally go on. Uh, I have prepared a session here, uh, and I can sketch a little bit. What I have here is that I have uh, two pens. The, the first one is a standard Bacom pen, and probably so that the Bacom tablets are the best supported ones within GIMP, but you can actually have others that are support for them in X, which is the, drive, the X driver of uh, uh, to do the X input support, but uh, we have a com here and it's quite working quite well. The second pen is a, is a stroke pen which has a longer stroke, so you have more precision in your when you draw with it. And I can show you here. I used the, the ink tool, and as you see, when I go in, uh, go into the buffer here, the device status up in the, in the corner here is changing. When see now, when I take the mouse. And go in. It's core pointer, and now it's my stroke pen, which I have, which I have here, and it's assigned to the ink. So I can have several pens here, and uh, as I show, uh, um, switch pens. The <coughs> tool will also switch, or the color, or whatever I have assigned to my pen. And uh, now I can start sketching here, and I can show you that it's. I can draw really thin lines here, and I can do pressure and get a very far. Pick one and go down here, and if I tilt the pan, it will, as you see, fill up like this. So I, I can do real nice color graphics like this, <coughs> or something like that. Uh, some shiny tech uh, signs here. Well, I don't know, but it looks nice. <laughs> uh, I can actually sketch, uh, for some example, an eye here with a nose and then I can take my other pen which I have uh, uh, mapped to uh, to uh, the brush and it's uh, as you see in the brush action dialogue here it's a quite fuzzy brush and if I uh, paint light here I can uh, put a little a bit of shadow down the eye here and it should be a little bit darker here and I'm kind of tired this person it's quite nice to draw and draw with, and I can uh, want to have a shadow down here under the under the eye eye. What's the name for it? Eyebrow. Eyebrow. And if I press hard here, I will get a thick line. But it's very easy to <coughs> to uh, sketch with. Just <coughs> sketching, and uh, you will get nice effects That's like good. some. Figure here. Yeah. So then, how to use your razor with yours? Yeah. Naturally, you have a razor on all the pants. Real pants, you have a razor on the back, don't you? And when you go in, where it's you have a assigned a razor naturally to razor and give them. I start to raise and then I turn, tip my pen around and I can start a pencil like this. <laughs> it's really nice. Yeah. Change the mouse pointer. Mouse pointer looks like a left-handed pointer, and I have problems with uh, small lines. Would be better the small pointer of the uh, right-handed. Uh, we discussed this yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> we got the source. <laughs> well, um, I think it's just really change the map. I think maybe it's really a good idea to change it to a uh, uh, Fadenkreuz or something. Uh, crosshair. Crosshair cursor. 
Should, it should be no problem at all. It should be trivial and probably will do it. <laughs> see. Or you can send us a patch. On. We'll include it then. That, that's the nice thing since it's open source. You can, when you get curious, um, uh, you can start hacking it. <laughs> What's Rectal Painter? I don't know. I don't follow your question. Yeah. Well, what support for natural brushes? Yeah. Practical, practical brushes, you mean? Natural brushes. Natural brushes, you like Fractal Design Painter, you mean? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I've been looking into that. <laughs> and uh, there are a patent there also, naturally, in the States. The problem is not here in Europe, you can code it, and there are implementation of the code that you can take to GIMP and start to hack it. But when uh, you can't uh, include them and distribute them in the US because there are patents that are covering that. So um, I don't know about it. It's, it's, uh, it's, first of all, it's quite difficult to implement. It's not easy. And uh, then there have, you have the patent. But I have um, looked into it and it should be doable, but it's very hard. Well. Uh, what I think what could be done, but uh, seems like a lot of work, um, is to add uh, some default paper structure on the um, on the image and try to find a good idea to uh, multiply uh, to to add the current brush on the paper paper and um, well would be a cool feature, but I. I don't know of somebody who implemented on this. Yet. I can see. <laughs> uh, we can. Uh, uh, that's that's a real good idea, I think. And yeah, but you can translate it to English. Uh, we can understand the rest of us. Uh -huh. No, c c could you ask the question again, please? He Well, um, it's it's not. I th I don't think this is practical for a real plugin as the current plugin system. But GIMP has extended by a module system, so you can load modules to the GIMP um, to add new features. And it would be a great idea to extend the module interface to get access to the uh, co coordinates from the mouse cursor, so you can can implement module tools. But uh, there are. This, this is definitely nothing for 1.2, and um, it's uh, may be a problem internally uh, because you have to organize these. You have to uh, add buttons to the toolbar, and well, it needs work. <laughs> it's, it's undoable with the plugin structure we have now. It's just too slow. You can't do that over the wire. And GIMP uses now to talk to the plugins. You can see here, um, I bring up the color selection dialog in GIMP, the new development version. As you see, there are several types of um, uh, way to choose your color. This one is really nice, I think. You can uh, drag it around here and then you can go in there and pick the color. It's really nice. Or you can take the git K, or you can take the watercolor that uh, simulates watercolors. Anyway, this is done with the modules. So this is one interface. of the usage for models. Modules, I mean. We have currently an interface for module color selectors, and maybe we'll add a, uh, uh, an interface for module tools. I think this should be possible. It's definitely on the to-do for something beyond Wonder 2, and would be a great idea, I think. I'm sorry. Yeah, it's yeah. on the to-do list for the... The idea is not new. It's been around for a long time. 
it's, the idea is not new to have uh, pluggable tools and all that stuff, but nobody has yet started to code it. Okay. No more questions? Seems everybody. Have you completely happy? delighted and Gimp predicted as, as all of said? Or? <laughs> Noch ein paar Fragen auf Deutsch, wenn sich jemand nicht auf Englisch zu fragen traut. No, okay. Then thanks for your attention. Oh. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> There are several ways, but the, the most easy is to just um, take a selection and, and do. Sorry. It's quite hard to do this with a pen. <laughs> Stroke. No, you have a floating selection at the moment. <laughs> yeah, I have. Sorry, I moved it. <laughs> Sorry, I will do the select again. It was me using the pen for selection. Yeah, but yeah, but the pro what is basic? So where do you want to stop? I'd like the the idea of a powerful program which does both. There is no such program at the moment, nowhere. Uh, the the thing is that you use a vector drawing program for vector drawing, and you use a bitmap program for bitmap program. Yes, I mean a, a line drawing or a geometrical shape oh, drawing tool right. that's implementable mm -hmm. and Gimp it's is much more powerful. <laughs> it, it's on a to-do as well for, but probably not for one that two because the feature freeze is in about one week, and there's a stroke. <laughs> yeah, it was me fiddling around. I'm not oh. used to this. <laughs> You're yeah. using the wrong brush. Yeah, I'm using the wrong brush also. So at the moment you have to create this. A selection and can stroke along the outline of the selection. That's how Gfig is working. Gfig makes a lot of selections and strokes along the selections. Really? Yeah, it I is. didn't know. Uh, you just look when it's working. The selection comes and then it strokes and <laughs> and you have. A, it's quite easy. That's how Gfig is working. The plugin to game to make vector drawing. So you have that functionality for basic vector drawing, and I, sh I don't. I personally, I don't think uh, you should take it any far with the game because you do vector drawing in, in a vector drawing program. But you can show them to draw a straight line. What? But you can show them how to draw a straight line. <laughs> That's at least this is possible. You just press Shift with any paint tool, and you get a straight line from your last spot to the current one. Yeah. Yeah, still looking up. Probably not with that notebook mouse pad. <laughs> no, it's not that funny to do it. Oh, But it works with the pen as well. <laughs> All of you still have a selection. Yeah. No, there's still a selection active. Yeah. yeah. Control. Right. Keep control. Okay. So. Well. So this is a feature of the graphics tablet. He pressed hard at the first point and. Uh, Light on the on the other end, so this will get interpolated. <laughs> I can say that I hate shortcuts. Yeah, shortcuts, and I hate <laughs> the, the problem is that all these little nice features are, are hiding behind one big right mouse button menu. So when you pop up the GIMP, you will see nothing but the toolbox. And if you're lucky, you get up this canvas, and in the canvas you have to pry the rest mouse button, and then the 
wonderful world of GIMP power opens, but not before. That's why we have this uh, don't forget to write now. Yeah, just, just a reminder, <laughs> just a reminder on the splash screen as, a, <laughs> as the very first tip on startup. <laughs> Yes, you have to press modifiers and it goes um, horizontal, vertical, or um, in an angle of 45 degrees. We should always try to use modifiers. Like all tools use all modifiers nowadays. <laughs> and the cursor should show you what you're doing. The cursor is, also, uh, is uh, for example, if you want to add to a selection the cursor, when you press the uh, modifier key, the uh, cursor will turn into a little arrow with a plus sign. So then you have an indication that you have pressed the, rest, uh, the right uh, modifier key. Yeah. Seems there. Are there any more questions? To one more? No, that the right. The, the right mouse button, if pressed in the canvas, is only for the for the menu. No. The left no. one is the action button for the tool. Naturally, you paint with the left mouse button, and the middle button is to, to, to scroll around the canvas. If your display, your window is smaller than your image, you just click and, around. and drag the image with the middle mouse button, button and can pan it around. There's uh, one situation where you want to use two mouse buttons at once. That is, you um, start to do a, a drag move or something, and you want to cancel that action without actually doing it. Then you press the right mouse button. Don't talk about selection, yeah. because then you use all three of them in all kind of uh, combinations. <laughs> Modifiers. To modify. But um, I think this is one. Uh, you, or most of the people uh, we have that are not used to GIMP is bashing GIMP because of the right mouse button menu system. And I can say you that um, when you get used to GIMP and use GIMP a lot, you will find right, right mouse button one of the best thing because what you're doing Photoshop is that you go up somewhere in the canvas and there is a menu and you do that a lot and then you get a mouse arm, but in GIMP you just press the right mouse button wherever you are and you get all the functions you need. Yeah, this is and that's really why happened. I don't know any of the we should shortcuts. Add, <laughs> we should add a feature to count the kilometers you drive around with the mouse and compare Photoshop yeah. with GIMP. <laughs> yeah. Always, yeah. yeah, it's much better. Uh, uh, can I pray? Uh, you using this is in in a production environment, or are you using this for fun? That's a big difference. Yes, you can use both. It's no problem. You can install them in different directories and have them both working. And. Uh, uh, Yeah, follow the development uh, version releases of GIMP, that's a good thing, because uh, it's always nice to fed, uh, feed uh, developers with bug reports, for example, and give feedback about the functions, and give feedback about how it works, and so on. That's always nice. And uh, it's nice to test all the new functions, and learn them, and so on, and sometimes you just want to use a new feature and uh, then you should use the developer version. But if you sit a lot and do image manipulation all day and uh, it's production environment and you, for example, make a very big image and you don't want it to have, to have it trashed, then it can be ideal to use the, the stable version because it is stable. And uh, it's, it's a matter of taste, how much you, or frill or daily frill. If you want some daily frame, you use the development version. If you <laughs> are want to be on the safe side, you use the development, uh, the stable version. But you would say with big cars, you have big, uh, 
yeah, you should probably not use the latest CVS unless you are very curious. Because <laughs> we are having um, regular releases like every month and Josh has promised to do more releases in the future. So uh, you can get a tarball that is supposed to be more stable than a CVS version that can be broken at that time if you're unlucky. You, you, you never knew if the, you can't knew, uh, know if you can compile the CVS version because it can one be in a broken state. But most of the time you can compile the, 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 the release, there are several releases of development versions. Then the yeah. Or subscribe to the mailing list and yeah. give proposals to our features. To very appreciated and back reports also. This is, I'd like to address all of you. <laughs> Otherwise, we have to find out what to do <laughs> <laughs> by ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it helps. Uh, it helps. What definitely helps development of GIMP is uh, feedback from professional designers and artists and so on that uses this for daily work because they know what they want to do and they, they can give you feedback from oh this is a bit awkward this way GIMP works or that's a nice feature and it shouldn't be that hard to implement or something like that. Thank you for programming. <laughs> <laughs> I can uh, just tell you one thing, that uh, there will be a second edition of the manual, as I said, and it will be out in September. Uh, and there is a, um, also a German version that you can buy, <coughs> and it will be freely downloadable <coughs> in sometime this autumn, the German version. And there will be a freely downloadable second edition English version also. And the new version is around 1,000 pages, so it's quite big, and there is a lot of information how to attach scanners and tablets and uh, how to buy a scanner and everything that has to do with uh, image manipulation around GIMP more or less. It's recommended reading because it's uh, look at, uh, try to look uh, up features in the manual before you try to use GIMP. <laughs> Otherwise you can get confused sometimes. Sure, for sure. And there will be an online help system in 1.2. Yeah. Context sensitive. So when you press uh, have the help system up and you press the tool, the, tool, uh, the help uh, file for that tool will get loaded into the help browser, so... Are you planning to integrate the into the GNOME? No, definitely not. <laughs> GIMP has to be independent of a session management system because if it was um, re relying on GNOME, you can't use it on KDE. The, um, or you people, can't use it on a silicon graphics. The GNOME you know, people are very interested in integrating it, but we have to figure this out somehow. Probably there will be patches, or we yeah. will have to do something. But GIMP will never <laughs> depend on GNOME. Optional compile switches are possible, but but this will not be the default anyway. Yeah, the, these are the plans of the GNOME people that are working on GNOMIFYING GIMP. <coughs> and there is <coughs> some code, but I have not checked it out, and we will definitely not merge it into the main trunk until um, we can assure that GIMP works without GNOME libs installed. Sorry, sorry. It's no chance to understand you.
Yeah, but there's but there's nothing decided about Cobra yet. It's a it's an option and it it's powerful, but it's too slow to do yeah. graphic manipulation. Yes, <laughs> too slow for the pixel data itself. Except you have a Cobra stream and then a network connection like that over there, then you could do it with Cobra. But I don't know if that's possible at all to do it fast enough with Cobra. Okay, thanks for all the questions. Yeah. <laughs>